interesting. Yeah, it's everybody else's time. <laughs> <laughs> Good acoustics yeah. in that room. There's somebody yelling all of a sudden. Um, I, well, I didn't yell. I just flung my stuff. Oh. <laughs> all right, so I'm gonna switch back to myself. All right, so before I start with the content of this class, you know, I would just have to share something with you guys. Last week, I got into a discussion with a colleague regarding accessibility requirements of you know video content, multimedia content that I you know, give you guys. I mean, you know, everything that I post on YouTube will falls into the category of you know AV or audio video you know type of uh, media. Okay, and some of you may be aware that there's an ADA or an American Disability Act, and also the Rehab you know Act or Rehab. Yeah, Act of the Section 508 of that um, Act also you know, specifies you know accessibility requirements. In other words, if I have a uh, student with either visual or aud auditory you know disabilities, I kind of have to make sure that student does not get disadvantaged uh, because of the disability in terms of access to the material. Okay, and that's understandable. If I were you know if I have problem you know, seeing or hearing, I certainly do not want to miss out content in the class. But here comes the tricky part. The tricky part is, um, some people believe, okay, and this not this is not the colleague that I was talking about, you know, but some people believe that any content that I post on the internet that is accessible accessible to my students, that'll be you guys, uh, need to fulfill that requirement, okay, or I cannot use it at all. I cannot post it or make it available to anyone to make sure that there's equality. Am I making that point okay so far? Okay. So as far as this class is concerned, at least you know, nobody had told me about any type of um, visual or auditory uh, impairment. Okay. Um, and if there's any, uh, the DSPS or the Disabled Student Programs and Services Department has resources. In other words, you know, they can assign note takers, they can assign real-time captioners, they can assign signers, and so on, you know, to you know, students who need that surface. So we will have, you know, I have had, you know, signers here, you know, doing all the signing when I have a student who could not even you know, hear what I'm talking about. So that student has to rely on the signing to understand what I'm talking about. But I don't see any here. But to some people, even if the class itself does not have a single disabled student, I will still have to do the captioning or I cannot put it on the internet. What do you mean by subtitles? Oh, subtitles. Subtitles, yeah, subtitles or a script. But you can see that I don't really teach this class out of a script. Has anyone suspected I have a little script somewhere here that I'm just reading out of this? Yeah, I have my suspicions. I'm going to put it back for the new Google Glass. Oh, the new Google Google Glass, yeah. Well, I'm uh, actually one step ahead, you know, it transmits to my brain directly. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> So if that is the case, if the captioning requirement is universal and it blankets everything, that means I can no longer post the screen recordings of my classes onto YouTube. Okay? And the end result of that, as far as I can see, is I'm taking a resource away from 100% of my students in order to make it equal, equal to 0% of my students. Even if that's only 1%, it's still okay, you can kind of make the argument. But when it's a 0%, I don't think that argument you know, works it's anymore, yeah. right? So that's something that I'm in the process of dealing with right now. Uh, has nothing to do with a colleague that I just talked about. You know, her job was to bring the awareness to faculty, but not so much you know, to set the policy and also to determine the scope of the policy. So we are now trying to work out, you know, where, where, where is the scope of the policy? I can see if this is a fully online class, that would be enforceable because you know, I'll be using the same content semester after semester, sem after semester, and maybe I can end up with a student with certain disabilities and require the captioning uh, or the closed captioning of that video. But since this is a face-to-face -face class, and I know, as far as I know, this class does not have any student with that need, would, does, it, does it still apply? So that re that's the question. So I just want to bring this up to you um, because you know if you see that other professors do not want to do screen recording, that might be one of the reasons. Yep. And then uh, it'll probably require you to do more work too because you have to 
that. Oh, it's going to be a lot of work because even though Google has automatic you know, closed captioning, it has the ability to do voice recognition and actually um, put in the closed captioning itself. It's not that good, or at least you know, with my accent, it's not working out. You know, Just the way it's supposed to. Put a disclaimer in the video details. <laughs> this is using. Google well, that's the other same. thing. You know, uh, they they've basically said the YouTube automated closed captioning is not sufficient to meet that requirement. <laughs> so, um, so at this point, you know, it's just kind of up in the air. But before they make a decision and say that I cannot do it, I will keep doing it. So, you know, so I'm not going to stop the recording uh, because you know this is kind of in a gray area. Um, so there we go, and I'm going to upload the notes from the for the previous class first. Which is kind of this is another way to for me to teach this class is just <coughs> use the video from the previous class and use it right away in this class. Then I can just kind of sit back and do nothing, right? <laughs> I think maybe that's why they don't want me to do the screen recording, so I don't have to just sit back and play, hit the play button and then just sit back and take a <laughs> take a little snooze here. Can we get a brunch or something like that. <laughs> All right. So let's go back and do our uh, first, the homework assignment. Okay, um, I'm, I'm hoping that you guys remember that I said that with the previous homework assignment, I'm breaking up into two parts. Do you still remember that? Yeah. So what is due today, you know, or about seven minutes earlier, this was really just the indentation mm -hmm. part. Okay, so you just have to do the indentation. You can do it in place, you can open a new sheet to do it, doesn't matter, you know, as long as I can see the indentated your version, that's good. So we'll go ahead and cover that part first, just to, so that you guys know what it is supposed to be before you start on the tracing part. So here we have our homework assignment. And am I in the right class? Nope, wrong class. There we go. Close that, close. All right, so here is, this is the right class. There we go. So the first thing we'll do is to take a look at the nested statement assignment. And I'll do the indentation. And I'll show you, you know, the process of doing that too, because you know, this is something that you will have to do with all of your homework assignments. Well, not the indentation part, but the understanding of the nesting part is important. All right, so here's the starting point of your homework assignment, and you have to figure out, you know, the proper indentation of this to the code. <laughs> but I do have to give you some warning. In some other classes, you know, um, the professor would actually ask you for your name, and then you get points deducted from your overall score. I'm not going to name that professor. If he even catches you on your phone, Get kicked out, and get kicked out again. You have to like go to dean and like have a letter. Really? Really? Think about it. Like, really? Think about it. No, like, no, like, 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 is he still CEO of yeah, Microsoft? No, I've been mean, going through a lot of uh, CEOs recently. Yeah, they, they got rid of him. <laughs> the bottom line is he's not there anymore. <laughs> he made a bad call. Well, I don't know. I mean, Microsoft has been going in strange, in strange directions lately. Have you guys heard of the new Nokia phone? The yeah. Nokia X line? Oh. Okay, you know, so the X line probably gets its name from crossing you know, platforms because it's supposed to be an Android phone. It uses the open source version of the Android, which means it cannot use any Google products. So it doesn't have you know, Google Play Store, doesn't have Google Map, doesn't have Google uh, Gmail as apps on that phone. So what is it useful for? Well, guess what? Microsoft is writing their own apps for that particular Android platform so to resemble the um, the Windows Mobile you know environment, so it has tiles and stuff like that. So this is kind of like a cross between Android and Windows, <laughs> and it's offered only by Nokia on their phones. 
Now, if you guys have been tracking Nokia you know, over the years, has it been going up or going down or just leveling compared to, let's say, let's say Samsung or HTC? How is it comparing? It's, it's going down, right? It's sinking a little bit, okay? So what are they doing now? I think you know, they're drilling holes in that boat. It's like, oh, we're sinking, might as well. <laughs> <laughs> but well, I, I could be wrong. Maybe this is the best way to do it, combining the best features of two worlds. I just do not think so. I, I just don't see that happening. All you right, so getting back to this. Reason. Sorry? You have yet to be given reason to believe that it would work. It just doesn't seem like it would work, you know, but I have no idea why they even bother to take that direction. <coughs> All right, so getting back to this code here, um, the first thing we'll do is we'll do the parentheses stuff first. So we will identify the beginning and the end of each construct, and then we'll do the indentation. But this time, doing the indentation, I'll do it from the ins outside in instead of the inside out. So we'll do it in a slightly different way. The process is still the same. We look at while and say it's the opening of something. We look at if, we know it's the opening of something. Else is kind of special because it's neither the close nor the opening. It's a separator. So you can use, if you prefer, you can use a comma to say that it is separating two things within this level of parentheses. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, just using a parenthesis, using a comma to, as a separator. We see another if is opening. We see an and if it is closing. We see another and if it's closing. This has nothing to do with parentheses. This is and while it is also closing. All right, so now we have the parentheses to help us indicate where's the beginning of something, where's the end of something. So as long as you know how to match parentheses in a normal uh, expression in mathematics, you know how to read this already, okay? What is contained within what? So we'll do it from the outside in. Now when you do it from the outside in, we start with the first parenthesis. And then we ask, where's the closing of this open parenthesis? What do you guys think? Line 13, very good. So we go from line 3 has a beginning and line 13 has its matching end. When we do indentation, we only indent whatever is in between the beginning and the end. In other words, the line 3 itself doesn't get indented, line 13 itself doesn't get indented as a result of the indentation. Okay, so I have just selected a block here in order to do the indentation. I'm also selecting the parentheses just so that you know, we can see how it works. So we'll go ahead and do one level of indentation. Are there any questions about this particular step or the result of this indentation here? So now we have taken care of the open on line 3 and the close on line 13. Now we can focus on just the stuff in between. So what I'll do is I'm going to highlight these two parentheses and just say, okay, these two are taken care of. We can now focus on the inside. When, we, when you look at the inside, the next level of parentheses starts with line 4. And the matching end of this open is where? On line 11. Very good. So this is the opening. Line 4 is the opening. And line 11 is the close. Okay. So in theory, we have to select everything in between, which is from line 5 to line 10, and do the indentation. But the separator itself does not get indented. So we have to exclude line 6 out of this entire thing. So I can select, after you select a whole, a whole block, you can actually do a control click again whoops, to unselect you know, just certain cells, which comes in a, you know, pretty handy as a handy feature. So are we doing okay so far? You know, does everybody understand what's going on? Yeah. Okay. Now the fact that they are already indented doesn't matter because now we are just looking inside the conditional statement from line 4 to line 11. So from that perspective, these things are nested one level deeper and that's why we will increase the indentation level of all of these cells. All right, so we have another level of indentation and now we can say this guy, this guy, and this guy are now taken care of. Okay, so we'll just highlight those particular things. And now we have only one line left that is inside uh, a pair of parentheses. Parentheses, and then it's just line 9 by itself. So we'll go ahead and in indent that particular line because it's inside a pair of parentheses. And then we indicate, oh, okay, we just took care of this also. 
So now everything is taken care of, and this is the end result. If you go from here to here, that is what your um, algorithm should look like once it is um, indented correctly. Okay. Okay. So this is what we need to do. So do we have any questions about the end result of the indentation or the process of identifying you know, the beginning and the end of each construct and then do the indentation? No questions? The line six was only indented once because? Because line six is a separator of line four and line 11. So it, has to, it should have the same indentation as line four and line 11. You can kind of look at it as a operator in parentheses. Any other questions? No other questions? What about the actual structure of the program? Are there any questions about you know, the actual structure of the program? Questions? Uh, I think I have a question. If you're, Go ahead. When you're doing the trace, um, mm -hmm. let's say you evaluate line four. Okay. And you find that it's false, so you go to um, line six or um, line seven. You, you have to go to the matching else of that condition. Yeah, you go to the else, but do you only go to line eight if you go to that line six else? Mm -hmm. Or, okay, like if line four is or if line uh, four is true, would you then skip to the end of that? Okay, I'm not going to answer that question directly. Okay. You know, <laughs> intentionally. But I can tell you that this is one branch of the outer conditional statement. This is one branch of the conditional statement starting on line four. This entire block is the other branch of this uh, of that conditional statement. So you kind of have to look at it that way, you know. Okay. Any other questions? Any other questions? <coughs> Right. Well, if there are no other questions, I'm going to create the quote-unquote new homework assignment, which is really just, just the second part of your homework assignment. Um, right now, we'll go ahead and go back to topic two, turn on editing. Is it useful to use like an online course management system to keep track of your homework assignments or do you guys still prefer the old way of getting a piece of paper as your homework assignment and you have to use your binder to keep track of everything? This is better? Is it doing, is it pretty much universal for all your classes now or just no. certain classes? Certain classes. Really? It's getting to Okay. Okay. I think it depends on the class too. I had I had a uh, online homework for a physics class and I hated it. It's horrible. Oh, they make it online, but it's difficult to do. It's difficult to do the online homework. Hmm. And the reason is. But um, I mean, there's. Is it just reasons. not lending itself to the online technology, or? Yeah, I mean, there's the fact that you have to sometimes you have to use special characters and stuff. And ah. A lot of exponents and stuff in your answer, so it makes it difficult to plug your answer in correctly. Yeah, and then you like miss one exponent, and that's a little over. Yeah. Well, there are ways to enter. So my math lab, then there's also the physics one, math oh. physics. Yeah, my, yeah. my, my math lab. <laughs> yeah. like, it's easy to do, but I mean, when you're typing a lot of exponents, you put something wrong, that's the whole world. So you don't get much of credit either. It's just like wrong. Exactly. Because from my perspective, it's just a whole lot easier to do it this way. You know, I can keep track of submissions and stuff like that, you know, a lot better. Um, not yet. We're getting close, though. Are we going to have to trace this statement on the test, the pre and post conditions? Yep, we'll have pre and post conditions as well as uh, traces. But those, two, remember, those two are two different things. You know, a trace only works 
if you know exact values of the variables. But what we are doing right now does not need to know the exact value. We just need to know what condition is true before a certain statement in order to derive the other statement. All right, so we are actually in topic three at this point. The homework is still in topic two. It is just, okay, let me just go back so that you guys know what it looks like or the name of the homework assignment. The new one, quote unquote new one, which is the second part of the same homework assignment, is called nested statements, you know, in parentheses, you know, tracing. So this one has the correct indentation to begin with. If you want to use your own as the starting point of the second part of the homework assignment, that's fine too, okay? I just want to make this available so that people can choose whether to use their own version of the first part of the homework assignment or the one that I just completed today. So either way works, you know, there's no, I don't have any particular preference one, one way or another. Yep. If you already turned in one that had it all done, do you have to resubmit it into Yeah, the I just turned in the same file in that case. Yeah, you can just go ahead and turn it in because I'm still going to go through the workflow of grading each one. You know, it's like doubling the amount of work. But, you know, but that's how I'm going to do it because some people may only do the indentation in the first one so they won't be you know, doing the actual uh, tracing part. So just tr upload it again, same file is fine, no problem. All right, so we are actually in topic three at this point. And for this particular class, if I remember correctly, we have already done the tracing or the uh, analysis of loops. Is that right? Okay. And let me just double check you know, where we were at last time. So let's check that. This is the something here. Oh, this is the second page, that's fine. I just want to find out you know, exactly where we left off from last week. So here we have the recording of this class. Absolutely. Just x is less than k. And then we have the other side, which is x is less than k, or post 2. When you look okay. at this side, versus this okay, side so here, that's where we side left. is more restrictive. Okay. The left hand side right. or the right hand side. All right, so what, what we'll do today is kind of repeat what we did last Thursday because I'm suspecting that you know some people might have forgotten you know about what we did last Thursday. And we'll start with a slightly different precondition as well. So this is still the same code that we were, that we are trying to analyze, same as last week. Uh, and then today, we'll start with a precondition that is not just true, okay? We'll actually say something about the precondition. All right, so in this case, we'll say the precondition, in this case, is just uh, uh, x is less than k to begin with. In other words, um, I'm given these two things to begin with. I'm given the pseudocode, the algorithm, and I'm also given with an assumption that is true, and basically someone just told me, let's say, tag, you are guaranteed that the variable x has a value that is less than k, all right? And that person who told me these two things is also asking me to say, well, Tech, can you tell me something about the variables after we get out of this loop, okay? Because that's the whole purpose of you know, doing this type of analysis is to figure out what is the post condition after a particular algorithm executes. Because we want to see whether it is doing what it's supposed to. All right. All right. So I'm not. This class benefits from the previous class because certain things I can just you know reuse. Okay. In this case, I'm reusing the picture representing this logic. So when you look at the right hand side, you know we have the, the picture of a typical three <coughs> checking loop. Okay. You can see that we check the condition x is less than k before we perform the operation of x gets x plus one. But what is more important in that picture are the little pink ellipses because each one indicates a particular really important point for analysis purposes. Pre-1, which is what I'm given with, is really just at the beginning of the entire thing because that's the condition that I was guaranteed to be true before you know, I run into, you know, before I execute this loop here. Is that okay so far? You know, the picture representation you know, of where pre-1 is located? Okay. 
And then we have the condition, which is here. Um, depending on the true false value of the condition, sometimes I go here, perform the operation, and then we go back to the beginning, reevaluate the condition. Other times, the condition evaluates to false, then I can take the exit branch and get all the way out, and you know, the condition of the exit is post 3, which is you know, the post condition of line 3. So are we still doing okay so far mapping the pseudocode to the picture? Yep. So let's say the precondition was uh, x is greater than k, and you could assume it's false, and it would just go out. Correct. You know, when x becomes greater than k, we definitely want to get out. Yep. That's the behavior of the following this logic. But nowhere in this diagram we talk about x is greater than k. So that may happen, it may not happen, but at this point we don't know whether it will even happen or not. Okay. Now, even more important would be uh, pre-2 and post-2. If you look at pre-2, pre-2 is basically saying what has to be true before, right before we execute this particular statement. Well, in order to even get here, you know, to be about to execute line 2, the condition of the conditional statement has to be true. I mean, not conditional statement, but the condition of the loop has to be true. Is that true? Okay. So that means you know, we can say something about pre-2. Okay, pre-2 is x is less than k, which is the condition of the while loop. It has to be true. But there are other things that I can also be guaranteed. Because in order to get here, I can, there are two paths to get here. One path to get here is go, coming straight from pre-1. In other words, this is the first time I get into this pseudocode here, and I go, and x is less than k to begin with, and I come to this point already. So that means now I have to say, well, one of the things that can also be true at the same time is pre-1. Whatever the assumption was before this loop you know, can be true at this point also because you know, I didn't have a chance to change anything yet at this point. But the other way is to say, well, maybe this is not the first time we got here. Maybe this is the second time, the third time. Maybe we have performed at least one iterations already. So that means we have gone through this path already at least once in order to get back into this point. That's one of the properties of a loop is you can go back to an earlier point of execution. So that means if that is the case, that means post two can also be true. But since I cannot tell which way I took to get here, I can only say that pre-1 or post-2 is true. Okay. Once again, it is not an either-or because they can both be true at the same time. So I cannot say either-or. I just say that at least one of these two has to be true. That's all I can say. Are we doing okay so far with you know, why pre-1 or post-2 is a component of pre-2? Okay. That or has to do with a merge. The merge is right here. Okay, this is the merge point. That is the, the reason why we have a disjunction or a or. All right. Well, that's good. Not a problem because we know what is pre one. Pre one is given to me already, and it is just you know a simple x is less than k. But what about post two? Mm, that seems like uh, something that I cannot determine at this point because you know I just you know determining what is pre two. Let's not worry too much about post two at this point. So we move on, and well, the next one is post two. Hmm. <clears throat> well, before we can kind of do some derivation, you know, from the precondition based on the assignment statement. This time we have a problem. What kind of a problem do we have? Okay. Let me, let, let's take a look at you know, these two, you know, the, the few derivations that we have done so far. We have pre-2 being defined as x is less than k and in parentheses, x is less than k or post-2. And now we want to derive post-2 based on pre-2. Is there a little problem here? Yes. Mm, yeah, we have a little problem here, right? Because we have post-2 not known, but in order to know what is post-2, we also have to know what it is. So, okay, that's fine. Um, an app that I recommend <laughs> <laughs> is Tasker. Um, I just like it a lot. Um, it's very flexible. 
It's not really just a timer to turn off your, um, it's not just a timer to turn off your the ringer. Um, it is fully programmable. Um, so you can program it on certain days only, like Tuesday, Thursday, Monday, Wednesday. Um, you can specify the time. And you can specify a bunch of other operations of you know, what you can do with it. Um, I would you know, suggest you to at least look into it. I know it's three bucks and it's not you know, exactly a free app, but you can do a lot of stuff you know, that is actually pretty handy and useful. Um, I personally use it a lot, you know, and I'm only using about 3% of the capabilities of this particular program. Um, and I can tell you that it is really, really flexible. The only thing I don't like about Tasker is it, it doesn't give me an option to save the program or the profile to the disk. I think it does, but I would like it to be able to save it on the cloud too. So when I need to uh, factory reset my you know, phone, to reinstall everything, it can download you know, my uh, specifications uh, from the cloud again. So that would be nice if they had that feature. Uh, but it really is quite useful. Um, if you have an Android phone, you know, I would say that this is one of the apps that you can look into for you know, many, many different purposes. All right, so getting back to my picture and also the derivation of POST2. Okay, so POST2 is a problem because in order to find out what is POST2, we need to know POST2. Okay, so it seems like kind of like a loopy kind of reasoning, right? So we don't know, quite know what it is. Okay, that's fine. We'll keep moving on. Let's take a look at POST3, which is down here. Now, POST3 in order to get to this point, what has to be true? X is greater than or equal to K. Yep, because X is less than K has to be false in order to take this false branch to get out of the loop. But at the same time, once again, we have two things. One of these two things also has to be true. Because in order to get to the exit point here, maybe I just got in here the first time, and then you know the condition becomes false, and then I get all the way out here already. That can happen because of the structure of the loop here. Maybe I took at least one iteration, and then I decide to exit because x is less than k at that point. So that means I still have to put in pre one or post two here. Yep. But uh, in this circumstance, pre one says that x has to be less than k. So that is correct. So wouldn't that mean that that is not necessary for this particular one? Okay, but that that is true because you're basically you're doing simplification ahead of time, but this is this is also guaranteed. Okay, you know whether we can simplify pre one out of the whole thing afterwards is a whole different story. Um, but this line is because of the structure of the loop, um, and what you said is true too. We can actually get rid of pre one because uh, pre one states that x is less than k which directly conflicts with x is greater than or equal to k. Okay, but because of the structure of this loop, we kind of have to write it out this way, and then we can later on, we can derive it and simplify it. Okay. All right, so it looks like everything hinges on what is post 2, because pre 2, the precondition of line 2, depends on post 2. The post condition of the entire thing also depends on post 2. And this is why post 2 has a, a specific name, because it is so important. It is the one thing that does not change when we go through this loop. Because you can see that this condition is true as we go through the iterations. This condition remains to be true when we get out of the loop. So this is the one thing that, hit, that is always true whether we are in the loop, going through the iterations, or we are exiting the loop out of the loop. And that's why it has a very specific name. For those of you who read, who read the notes before this class, will probably probably know the name of this condition. It is called the, the condition that doesn't change. <laughs> okay. I can see that nobody read the notes ahead of class. <laughs> All right, post two is known as the loop invariant. Okay. The word invariant means what? It does not vary, it does not change, okay? So that really is the condition that does not change, okay? So it has a very specific, you know, uh, meaning in this context. All right. Well, having a name doesn't help us solve the problem, right? Doesn't help us determine exactly what it is supposed to be. And in this class, I'm not going to tell you how to find out what is supposed to. 
But what I will do is I will say, well, let's just say that I thought about this problem before I went to bed, and in the morning I woke up and I got the an inspiration. Eureka. Okay, yeah, Eureka, <laughs> and I just say, you know what? I think you know post two can be this. So we're gonna write this down. Okay, hack things post two is x is less than or equal to k. All right. Now, that is something that I can just say, that I can just pull out of thin air and say, yep, that's the case, and you know, just leave it at that. But I can also plug this back into the framework and see whether it works out in the framework itself to validate it, right? In other words, what I can do now is to say, well, it's OK to have a suspicion that post 2 is x is less than or equal to k. But will that work in this particular framework? In other words, if I plug in post 2 is x is less than or equal to k into this framework here, will it work out? Or will, it, will I come into some kind of you know, conflict or logic contradiction, and therefore you know, it, it, I can prove that it does not work? Is that OK so far? So let's go ahead and plug it back in and see whether it works out or not. All right. So to validate, plug it in and test. Okay. Not something that you would do with a bomb, but with you know this type of uh, derivation, it's okay. <laughs> <coughs> so let's go ahead and say, well, okay. Let's take a look at pre two first. Okay. So pre-2, I'm just going to repeat the entire thing here. X is less than k, or pre or post-2, but now that we suspect post-2 is x is less than or equal to k, let's see what this will work out to be. First of all, we can see, we will try to do some simplification whenever we can. The question is, can I simplify this to something simpler? Okay, x is less than k, or x is less than or equal to k. Can I simplify that? Just x is less than or equal to k. It simplifies to x is less than or equal to k. Very good. And can someone tell me just intuitively why I can do this simplification? Because that contains x is less than k. It contains, right? One contains the other. And because this is a disjunction, the bigger one or the containing one is the one that I need to keep. The other one is already in the you know, uh, contained one already. So when you draw a picture, how many people know what is set theory? Did they, use, did they talk about set theory in high school? No? In too long. In too long. <laughs> well, it is one of those things where you don't forget. Um, and of course, my pen is inside the pocket. All right, in set theory, what it means is if you have one set that is inside another set, uh, when you try to find the union of the two, it is just the one that is containing. And the union operation is closely related to disjunction. You can also look at this from the number line perspective. If you look at the number line, you have you know, one, okay, let's say k is over here. One condition says you know, x has to be less than k, so x can only be from here and down. One is saying x is less than or equal to k, which means x can start with here and down. When you look at the disjunction, it means well, it only has to meet one or one of the two one or it has to meet at least one of the two requirements. So if I meet this requirement, then it's good because you know this also it includes the other one. So that's why I can just choose the one that is more general in the case of a disjunction. Okay. Can I do another simplification here? It says you know, x is less than k and x is less than or equal to k. Can I simplify it here? Uh, I don't think so. Yep. Because so if it x becomes equals k, then oh wait. It simplifies well, to x is less than k. But does it does it work with you, you know, intuitively, or do you think you know? Well, maybe maybe not. I don't really see how that. Case. Not really? Doesn't it's not clear? Okay. If this is not clear, there are several ways to look at this. Um, we can prove it using Boolean algebra. 
we can also try to work out work this out um, using just logic. So either way is okay. Okay, so let's look at it at in logic. It's from the logic perspective. Okay, so we have x is less than k. We have x is less than or equal to k. And then we have x is less than k and x is less than or equal to k. So it's kind of like the truth table that we have used in the past. And we'll first say that, well, I don't know about the, these two being independent or not. So let's say that you know we say, OK, when this is true, this can be true. And this whole thing is going to be true. When this is true, this can be false. And this thing can be false. When this is false, this can be true. And that whole thing is false. And when this is false, this can be false. And that whole thing can be false. OK, there's a problem here. OK, the problem has to do with this row, at least this row here. Why is there a problem with this row? In other words, can you find me at a value for x and a value for k so that x is less than k, but x is not less than or equal to k? Can I find a case like that? No. No. So that means this row should not exist. I mean, it cannot, cannot happen. All right? If this row cannot happen, we get rid of it. All right? So now we are down to three rows. So the question, the next question is, can this work? Yeah. yeah. It, it, it can work. I mean, that's OK. Because if x does equal to k, then x is less than k is false. false. But x is less than or equal to k is true. And the entire thing is also false. That works out. Okay. The last case, can that work out too? Yeah. Yeah, that could definitely work out. Um, k, x can be you know, k plus 1, right? You know, if x is k plus 1, then x is less than k is false. x is less than equal to k is also false. And then those two combined is also false. OK, that's good. But is that really proving the point that x is less than k and x is less than or equal to k? can be simplified to just x is less than k. What do you think? Look at the columns. Can you find two columns that have identical patterns? When you look at the column x is less than k, it goes true, false, false. Right? When you look at the column for the entire conjunction, it is also true, false, false. What is that telling us? Yes. We can simplify. Okay? And we can simplify. Well, like <laughs> Correct. They are, they are equivalent. Okay, because you can only say that it is equivalent when two columns are identical. In this case, they are identical. X is less than k. The column is the same as the other column, which is x is less than k and x is less than or equal to k. So this is kind of one in um, intuitive way to look at this to basically say, yep, we can perform that simplification because this expression, which is this expression here always use exactly the same result as this expression, which is expressed by this particular column in the table. Are we doing OK so far with a somewhat, you know, I would call this not so rigid proof, but it is OK. It works out for most people. OK. <coughs> All right. So pre-2 is done. Let's work on post-2. Let's work on post-2 itself, right? So I made the assumption that I think that post 2 is just this, but that's not good enough, OK? Because now I want to do the de derivation to prove that post 2 does work out assuming that it has you know, that value to begin with. All right, so let's do some derivation here. Because line 2, if we go back to line 2, line 2 does a very simple thing. All it does is to increment the value of x by 1. That's all it does. So that means if I know that before the increment, x has a value that is less than k, what can I say after the increment? Can I still somehow relate x to k? Let me repeat that question. I know that before the increment, x has a value that is less than k. I just added 1 to x. What can I do to reestablish a connection between x and k? x minus 1 x minus 1 is its old value, and its old value was less than k. So I can now basically just say the same thing. 
and just say that x minus 1 is less than k. Is that OK? Does everybody understand that what I just did here? I used the minus 1 to undo the operation of incrementing the value of x so that I can go back to the value of x before the operation. And because before the operation, it, has a it had a value that, is, that was less than k, if I perform this operation, x minus 1, it should still be less than k. Is that OK? All right. Yep. I have a question um, mm -hmm. about pre-2. How can x be less than or equal to k when the precondition is true that x is less than k? That's exactly why it simplifies to x is okay. less than k. Yeah. But from the logic perspective, you know, from the derivation perspective, it works out. Now, I do have to go through that even though, you know, you're absolutely right that x is less than k has to be true, but I have to plug in the assumption of post 2 to make sure that it works out. Right. <coughs> yeah. So that was the whole purpose of you know, going through that derivation, because we know that in, post, in pre-2, x is less than k is at least one of the conditions, if not the only. But I do have to plug it in just to make sure that it works out. Okay. All right. So now that we have you know, post 2 you know, being x minus 1 is less than k, we seem to have a problem because x minus 1 is less than k is not equivalent to x is less than or equal to k in general. Okay, if x is a real number and k is a real number, one does not imply the other. But one implies the other, but they are not equivalent. Okay, <laughs> so this statement here, x is less than or equal to k and x minus 1 is less than k are not the same unless we make one assumption. What assumption would that be? Under what condition can we just say that, well, you can say x is less than or equal to k. You can also say x is less than k. Okay, let me just go to the other one here. This is the same thing as x is less than k plus 1. You know, it's just algebra. Um, but under one condition, I can say that these two are the same. Under what condition can I do this? I can restrict the type of value of x and k to make it happen. Yeah, the integers. Exactly. If I can say that x and k are both integers, then these two expressions are the same. So let me write it here first, and then we'll check whether it makes sense or not. So I'm making this claim, because now that I make the assumption and tell you that x and k are both integers, now I can say x is less than k plus 1 is really the same thing as saying x is less than 4 equal to k. Does it make sense to you? Okay, let's think about in each case, what is the largest value of k, of, excuse me, the largest value of x that can still meet that requirement. But this time we know that x and k can only be integers. Okay, so let's think about that. Let's look at the first one first. I'm going to highlight it so that we know which one we are talking about. Let's look at this requirement. What is the largest value of x that can still make this condition true? x equals k x equals k. But x equals k is the last value, the largest value of x that can still make this true, because the next available value, assuming x is an integer, is already k plus 1, and k plus 1 cannot be less than k plus 1. Is that okay so far? So the largest possible value that can make this condition true is when x equals to k. Then we look at the other condition. And we say, what is the largest value of x that can make this condition true? This one is a little more obvious, right? You know, x is less than or equal to k. So x, the largest value of x that can make this expression still true is just k, x equals k. Did I just say x equals k in the previous one too? Yes. Yeah, so. All right. Well, we, just, we, ju we have just made our point. And what is the significance of this? What is the significance of going through the derivation and come to the conclusion of my eureka moment? It's a validation. Okay, I just validated that my eureka moment or whatever inspiration I got was actually correct. Okay, it worked out. Is that okay? So now that we know x is less than or equal to k is post 2, we can now finally go ahead and finish the entire thing because now we can plug that in into post 3 
and find out what exactly is post 3. So we go back to post 3 here. Post 3 is x is greater than or equal to k. And this whole thing here, pre-1 we know what it is already. It's just x is less than k. Post 2 we now know, you know what it is. It's x is less than or equal to k. All right, so let's go through some derivations here. And I think most people can look at this and, and basically say, I know there's something interesting going on here. Because every single comparison involves just x and k on either side. It's really just the relationship that has changed, right? What is greater than or equal to, what is less than, and the last one is less than or equal to. So something you know, fun is going to happen here. We'll deal with the uh, disjunction first. In other words, we look at this expression here, and we ask, can we simplify that to a single comparison? Well, we did that already, right? We did that already uh, in the case of a disjunction. And the two sides, if one side implies the other side, then we keep the side that is implied. Okay. In this case, x is less than k implies x is less than or equal to k. So we keep the implied uh, side, which is x is less than or equal to k. This has everything to do with uh, what we talked about maybe a week ago, about uh, the if, only if, and also the if and only if. Which one is a necessary condition? Which one is a sufficient condition? It has everything to do with that. Because in the disjunction, we keep the condition that is implied or the, you know, okay. X is less than K is a sufficient condition for x is less than or equal to k. So x is less than k implies x is less than or equal to k. We keep the more general one, so we keep this one here. Okay. Now can we do something about this? Okay. Now we have x is greater than or equal to k, and x is less than or equal to k. Well, first of all, can I find at least one value of x that can meet this requirement? Only when x equals k. So it simplifies to just x equals k. Is that working out for everybody, or is it kind of like, mm. there are two ways to prove this. One is more intuitive. It is using the number line concept. If you use the number line concept, okay, then we are looking at, you know, I'm sorry my pen is running out of ink here. Okay, we have a value of k on the number line. The first condition, the one on the left-hand side, says x is greater than or equal to k. So that means you know, we can start here, and every value to the right-hand side will meet the requirement of x is greater than or equal to k. The right-hand side specifies x is less than or equal to k, which means we can start here, and then we include everything to this left-hand side. When you use a conjunction, you're looking at the intersections. What is common between the two ranges? Uh, what is common between the two ranges is this part here, which, turn, which, turn, which turns out to be k itself. So that's one way to kind of convince yourself that we can simplify the expressions so that you know x is greater than or equal to k, and x is less than or equal to k, just simplifies to x equals k. <coughs> There's another way to look at this which is going to be a lot longer, so I'm not going to go through that. But I'll just kind of mention the method. You expand x is greater than or equal to k to become x is greater than k or x equals k. So either side, both sides will expand to a disjunction. And then you can use the distributive property of disjunction and conjunction, and then work out that whole thing. And then the only thing left would be just x equals k. But that's going to be very lengthy. You know, there's a lot of stuff you know going on. But almost everything reduces to false, except for this one. So you can basically simplify the whole thing to x just equals to k. Yep. Uh, when we went over this on the twenty, I think it was. Um, I took notes on it. Uh, post three, the first thing that you put was not, um, and then x is less than k. k. Right. Which is um, x is greater than or equal. So it's the same thing, yeah. The negation of x is less than k is x is greater than or equal to k. Okay. Now, what is this whole exercise? What is this telling us? If, we, if you take a step back, what have we just accomplished? Well, let's go back and take a look at what we were given with. We were given with an algorithm 
we were also given with a precondition, and we ended up with a post condition of that algorithm. In other words, I don't need I don't need to know what exactly is the initial value of k. I don't need to know the initial value of x. I can make the conclusion that x and k must be the same when we get out of the loop. Is that okay so far? Okay. In your test and also in your homework assignments, I'm not going to ask you about loops. Okay, the conditional statements and assignment statements are within the scope of what you need to do. Loops are particularly difficult because figuring out the, the uh, loop invariant conditions, the condition, it's kind of difficult. So that's why I don't want to include that. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh, she. Good reminder. Okay, in the row sheet, you know, I I did not, I forgot to bring it on last Thursday, so I kind of crossed out the entire column. So today is the twenty. It's the twenty fifth. Oh, this one is way up. Okay, I'm just gonna Do doctor it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just gonna doctor this so that it's twenty fifth no. instead of twenty second. The doctor doing doctor. Yep. There we go. So are we still doing okay so far with this stuff? Is that okay? All right. How can this be formatted on the test? So how can we transfer that to a piece of paper? You have to write it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in the test, it, you, it's just going to be a whole lot of writing. How <laughs> cool. what format is it going to have to be to do all these things? Um, it has to be enough to show me that you understand the process, you know, why you, know, you can derive this from this step to this step. Um, this one uses a lot of stuff that I would not require, you know, in the, in, a, in a test. In other words, in a test, I'm not going to make the assumption that people know about Boolean algebra and do some of the simplifications that I do in class. That's just to help us understand. Yeah, understanding. You know. Yep. All right. Any Excuse other me. questions about you know this stuff here so far? <coughs> We're gonna have some practice with it. Yeah, we'll have some practice. You know, um, on Thursday, you know, after the nested homework assignment is due, then we'll have homework assignments for pre and post conditions. All right. So so far, the only application of pre and post conditions is what? Why are we even talking about this kind of stuff in this class? See, not works. throwing darts. Okay, so we don't want to throw darts, right? We, we want to prove if algorithm works or not without using any darts. Okay, that's that's the ultimate purpose of this whole thing. But I also told you that there was the holy grail of software engineering, didn't I? Which means it is not practical. We cannot really have a, a, a team of programmers or mathematicians to go through millions of lines of code to do this sort of analysis. It is not impossible, okay? It is just not practical. So if it is not practical, why even talk about it at all in this class? Well, it's because it has a flip side that is actually very practical. Okay. How many people know what a bug is when it comes to programming? What is a software bug? Problem with the code. Problem with the code. Okay. So exactly what exactly what can can someone be more specific? Go ahead. Um, something that you didn't expect to happen. All right. Not functioning correctly. Not functioning correctly. Not something that you expect from the program. In other words, your program is not doing what it is supposed to. Okay. And does anyone expect to write programs perfectly every single time? Sure. It would be nice. I was actually hoping that someone would raise their hand so I can actually follow up with uh, you know, another statement. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to pretend to be that person and raise the hand and say, I'm tagged, you know, I'm a perfect programmer. I do not make mistakes at all. All my programs will work you know, from day one. Okay, not a problem. But you know what? You cannot, you know, write your own program when you get out in the industry. What do you think will be your first job as a software engineer or a developer, someone who's going to write programs? What is going to be your first job? Troubleshooting, yep. Usually, you know, at least in the past, what software companies or the large ones would do is they would give you a toothbrush and they'll tell you to clean up the bathroom. Or the equivalence thereof when it comes to you know software development. Okay, so what does that mean? It means you know you'll be doing 
you will be fixing you'll, you'll be fixing bugs in existing programs. Okay, somebody calls in and say, oh, this program just crashed or is doing something that is incorrect, and then your boss will assign that bug to you and say, okay, you go ahead and fix that bug. And then you open up the, the source code, those million lines of code, right? <laughs> and then you say, but I didn't write a single line of this program. Why am I going to fix this program? And then your boss will say, well, because you want this paycheck, <laughs> right? Well, there are specific reasons why you know, a lot of companies would assign you know, these type of problems to you know, newbies or people who are just getting into the company. Because one, they can test whether this uh, person can do diagnostics. Okay, because debugging is the ultimate test of logic. Can you apply logic and apply your analytical skills to get the problem solved? Okay, so it's a good test. The second thing is it will also help you get familiarized with the software. Because nothing helps, you know, you know, nothing helps more when it comes to compares to, okay, here's a million lines of code. Figure out which part of this program is responsible for this behavior of the program. Right? Now, fortunately, a lot of times when a program crashes, depending on how it was written, sometimes it will tell you exactly which line is expected, is, is seeing something it is not expecting. Let me just repeat that, repeat that statement. If a program is designed correctly, uh, the programmer will put in what we call assertions into the program. An assertion is nothing more than a condition that whoever wrote the program thinks this condition should be true at this point. If it is not, stop the execution of the program, print out the line number, and say, call this number, and tell them this assertion failed. Okay, And we know there's a problem at this point. Are we doing okay so far? So your job is to start with that line number in that program, and then try to go back in time and figure out how did I get here? I know I'm not supposed to be here, or when I'm here, the values are not supposed to be the way it is, but how did I get here in the first place? That would be a really good, useful thing for you guys to do, is to learn the skills to do all that. Is that making any sense so far? But why is this stuff going to help at all? Because it looks like we want to be able to walk backwards and not forward. All of this stuff here is just really telling you how to go forward, but not really backwards. It's really about the same type of analysis, isn't it? Going backwards. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll, I'll give you an example of how to apply this type of logic so that you can you know, walk backwards and say, if I know what is happening at this point, I can go back a few steps at least and figure out what has to be true at a certain point in the past. Okay, so we'll start with something simple. We'll start with something like look that looks like this. On line three, we have x gets x plus one. And we'll start with this, just one single statement. So let's say the post condition of line three, which is where the program crashes and the assertion you know, prints out and say that, okay, this condition is not supposed to be true. So let's say on post three, we have you know, a condition that states that x is um, less than Well, let's make it, uh, x is greater than uh, z plus 2, the whole thing times 5, and then divided by y. Okay, let's make it just artificially complicated here. Okay, this is post 3. And uh, this condition is not supposed to be true at that point. Okay, so the assertion statement in this program just failed, and then it prints out a message and say on line 3, you know, this condition is not supposed to be true, somebody has to fix it. And your job is to figure out, well, how did I get here? And one thing you have to do now is to try to walk backwards. In other words, if I know this is the condition of line three, can I go back in time as, and figure out what is pre three, right? What do you think? Is there a way for me to work out you know, what is pre three? Like the problem? Sorry? You break it up the parts. Say again? You break it up into different parts. You break it into different parts. Well, let's look at the type of statement here, okay? What do you think line three did to x? Add one. It added one to x. In other words, x got incremented when x did line three. So we know that after the increment, 
x has a value that is greater than or equal to that complex you know, expression on the other side. Okay. Can I reverse this and say, well, can I say something about before the increment? Can I say something that will relate x to the values of z and y? Um, that's the post condition. So in the precondition, which refers to the value of x prior to the increment, so that means it is x plus 1 and not x minus 1. The rest can be the same. Is that making any sense? Now, let, let's, let's just stop and take a little moment here to make sure that we know why this is an x plus 1 and not an x minus 1. It's an x plus 1 because in post 3, that x refers to the value of x after the increment. In pre 3, this x refers to the value of x prior to the increment. The value of x prior to the increment is 1 less than the value after the increment. So that means if I want to maintain the relationship of greater than or equal to blah, 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 I need now to add 1 to the value of x prior to the increment to get to the value of x you know, after the increment. Then I can use the same relationship with you know, in the expression. Is that OK so far? All right. Well, I have just you know, performed one thing to reverse, to get back to the previous step. So now I can try to apply the same type of reasoning to line two to reverse back to the pre two. When I get to pre two, I can try to reverse it back to line one. Then I can figure out what exactly is the condition on you know, prior to the execution of the entire program. Is that making any sense? You know the approach. What I'm trying to accomplish here. So assignment statements are not too complicated. It has to do with functions and inverse functions, which we will talk about later. But other things can be a little bit more tricky, like conditional statements can be a little bit more tricky. So let's see if we can work out you know, one case for a conditional statement. So let's say we have something that looks like this. If x is less than y, then um, z gets a value of 3, else z gets a value of 5, and if, and let's do some line numbers here. Line one, Oops. Five. Okay, there we go. All right. So, as right after line five, the program bombed out with a message, and say um, this value is not supposed to be true at this point. Okay. And let's say the you know, the program doesn't print anything except that x equals to five. So it doesn't say anything else. It just says you know x equals to five. Z, sorry, yeah, Z equals 5, and can we do something about this? I mean, it doesn't sound like a lot of information to start with. Uh, it just says you know, X equals 5 as you know, the post condition of the entire conditional statement. But can I apply some logic and see if I can go back a little bit? Okay, so let's see if we can do something like that. Okay, now we know that line 5 is at the merge point of the two branches. Which means, potentially, okay, we can say you know post four may be the same, and then we can say maybe post two is that too because one at least one is going to contribute to z equals five. I don't know which one, but I know potentially both can contribute to z equals five. Are we making any sense? Okay. Let's work with uh, post four first. Okay. Does it make sense that post 4 may be able to contribute to z equals 5? Yeah, I mean, you know, line 4 is an assignment statement directly changing the value of z to 5. Okay? But can I say anything about pre 4, the precondition of line 4? Now, pre 4 has two significance. Pre 4 has one significance because we might or might not be able to say what is the value of z before line 4, but it has another significance being the first line of the else branch. Okay. So we'll take a look at the first one first. The first one is, can we say something about the value of z at this point? 
No, because you know line four is completely overriding the value of z. So that means we know what is happening after. We know the value of z after this statement, but there's no way for me to reverse the operation to find out the value of z prior to this operation. So as far as z is concerned, it can be anything. I have no idea what is the value of z before. So just for this time, okay, I'm going to use this notation just to say that, well, we don't know what it is. Okay, but there's one other thing that we know for sure. Because in order to get to line four, what has to be true in order for me to even get to line four? X squared than y. X is greater than or equal to y. Okay, X is less than y has to be false. Okay, well that's good. That is something. Okay, so the one, the one thing we can say about you know, z equals to whatever is just to say, I can't say anything about it, right? So it, it's just you know, true, and then we have x is greater than or equal to y, and we know that this can simplify to just x is greater than or equal to y. Are we doing okay so far? Okay. So let's take a look at the other one, which is post 2. Now, from the structure of the conditional statement, we think that post 2 can contribute to the final condition. But when, it, when we look at the actual assignment statement, z, equals, z gets a value of 3, can that contribute to z equals 5? Yeah. No, nope, it contradicts with that, right? Okay, so when we look at post 2, because of the statement itself, post 2 is really should be you know, whatever we think it is, and z equals 3 because of the statement itself. Does, does everybody understand why I appended this portion to the post condition because that has to do with the actual condition at the actual statement z gets the value of 3 so what is that telling you z equals 5 and z equals 3 gives you a result of what false, false. it's just false okay now if the post condition of a line of a statement is false the precondition is going to be false also in this case so that means this, this branch is dead, okay? We could not possibly have come from this branch. If the post condition of line two is false, that means the precondition of line two is also false, okay? Now let's go take a look at pre one, okay? Pre one, because we are walking a conditional statement backwards, so we start with the split, we go through each branch, and then now they merge, okay? When they merge, I don't know which side I come from, so I can only say it's one or the other. It's, in this case, it's the one of the preconditions, at least one of the preconditions. So pre-1 now becomes pre-2 or pre-4, and then we can expand what is pre-2. Pre-2 is false. Pre-4 is x is greater than, oops, greater than or equal to y, and the disjunction of these two would be x is greater than or equal to y. That's the only thing we can conclude knowing that z equals 5 after line 5, immediately after line 5. Is that making any sense? Okay. Now this one seems to be pretty easy, right? I mean, because, you know, well, line 4 is the only line that can change the value of z to 5, so we have to come from, to be coming from that branch. Let me give you another one that is a little bit more confusing. And we have Probably just enough time to do it. Okay, so here we have something that we have seen already. I think we have seen this already. Okay. And here's line two. Line two says, you know, z gets, x gets uh, the negation of x. And I think some people like to have a zero in front of it. Which is fine. Z gets, x gets x. And on line five, we have and if. All right. Do we still recall this code? Yeah, a little bit. Okay. So let's say post 5 in this case is um, x has a value of 3. Okay, that's it. What can we do in this case? Well, then we can say there are two ways to contribute to post 5. We know it can be post 2. It can also be post 4 because both can feed into post 5. Let's focus on one at a time. Let's say this is coming from post five. Uh, let's say this is coming from line two. After line two, x has a value of three. 
Is it possible? You look at the expression, or you look at the uh, assignment statement on line two. Is it possible that after I perform x gets zero minus x, x ends up with a value of three? Can I find the value of x before this operation? That can make this happen. Yeah. We can, huh? Okay, so the precondition of line two is going to be what? x equals to negative 3. Now on top of this, we also, line 2 also has another significance. Because line 2 is the beginning of the then branch, so what else has to be true at this point? x is less than 0. x is less than 0 also has to be true. Okay, so we have to state that. x is less than 0 has to be true. Okay, very good. Um, can we simplify this? Or does it, is it conflicting and we end up with a contradiction? Which way? X is less than 3. X is equal to negative 3. X equals to negative 3 is the one that we can keep. Yeah. But there's no contradiction. In other words, you know, X equals to negative 3 does not conflict with X is less than 3. It is just more specific that we are saying that X is now not just less than 0. We know exactly what it is. So we can keep just that. OK, so pre-2 is just X equals negative 3. We do a simplification here. Let's look at post 4, okay? We took a look at post 4 here. Post 4 is like this. Is there a way to say about, what, what can we say about pre 4 in this case? Line 4 doesn't seem to do anything. So whatever is the post condition is also going to be the pre condition. All right. So the pre condition is the same as the post condition. But since it is also the beginning of an entire branch, what else do we know? What else has to be true? right before we start to execute line 4. X has to be less than, or greater than, greater than or equal to Greater than or equal to. All right, well, that's cool. X is greater than or equal to 0 because the condition of the conditional statement has to be false in order for me to get to line 4. Okay, And I think we can do some simplification here. It's a conjunction. We have to keep the one that is more specific. Well, first of all, it's one condition containing the other one. And we want a more specific one. So which one are we keeping? X equals 3. All right, very good. So X equals 3 is the only one we keep. So now we want to work on pre-1. In other words, what can we know for sure that has to be true prior to the execution of line 1? Well, we have two ways to come in, right? We can come in from the left. We can come in from the right. If we come in from the then portion, then pre-2 is the one that is true. But if we come in from the other branch, then pre-4 has to be true. We only know, we know that at least one of these two has to be true, so we can only use a regular disjunction. Pre-2, we already figured that out, it's just x is negative 3. Pre-4, we figured out that x is 3. So this way we know, we can make to the conclusion that even though I don't know which one it is, but we know x is either negative 3 or 3 prior to the execution of line one. Is that making any sense? But you can see that we are now walking backwards, okay? But we are applying the same kind of logic and reasoning as what we did going forward. Now going backward, you know, in all practical you know, senses, it's always starting with a specific value because when the program crashes, most of the time you can know something about the values of the variables. Um, but applying the logic that we have learned now we can go backwards. And this is debugging technique. You know, we are you know, trying to find out you know, how we got to a certain point of the program. Do we have any questions about you know, why we talk about this, you know, how this fit in into you know, the grand scheme of writing programs? Do you think this type of technique only is useful for professional programmers, or do you think this might be useful for anyone who writes any type of program? Anyone? Yeah. All right. So we are running out of time, so we'll go ahead and uh, continue with this on Thursday. And don't forget the second part of your homework assignment.